Have you ever wondered how quickly a thrilling adventure can turn into a deadly encounter? Across the diverse landscapes of our planet, from the dense forests of Tanzania to the rugged wilderness of Botswana, nature holds untold mysteries and dangers. These tales of animal attacks, each a harrowing brush with death, unveil the fine line between awe-inspiring beauty and dangerous reality. Experience the gripping stories where unexpected encounters with the wild turn tragically fatal. In the heart of Tanzania, bordered by the vast wilderness of South Africa, lay a small, tranquil village named Mwanga. It was a place where the sun painted the sky in hues of orange and red every evening, where the savanna met the horizon, and where wildlife roamed freely. In 1954, Mwanga was known for its serene beauty and the coexistence of its residents with nature. However, a tale that would forever mark the village's history lay beneath this tranquility. The main character, Thomas Fletcher, a British wildlife researcher, had arrived in Mwanga six months ago. His passion for the wild had brought him to the heart of Africa, where he aimed to study the behavior of big cats, particularly lions. Accompanying him was his assistant, Sarah McKayley, a Tanzanian zoology graduate with an extraordinary understanding of the local wildlife. Thomas and Sarah spent days tracking and observing a specific lion called Asad, meaning lion in Swahili for its regal demeanor. Asad, a magnificent beast with a fur coat that glowed like burnished gold in the sun, had become the focus of Thomas's research. He wanted to understand how Asad interacted with his environment, a quest that brought them closer to the lion each day. Though distant from the bustling cities, the village of Mwanga was not isolated from the dangers in the wilderness. The villagers had learned to live with the constant presence of wildlife, understanding their boundaries and respecting the delicate balance of nature. However, an unusual series of events had begun to unfold. Livestock started to disappear, and the unmistakable tracks of a lion were often found near the scenes. Fear gripped the villagers as whispers of a rogue lion began to circulate. Elder Mzi Juma, a respected figure in Mwanga, called for a meeting. The villagers gathered, their faces etched with concern. Mzi Juma, a man who had seen many seasons, spoke of the need for caution and vigilance. The village, he insisted, must not engage in any act that would provoke the lion. However, unease grew, and the villagers avoided venturing out after dusk. Thomas and Sarah, aware of the villagers' concerns, intensified their efforts to track Asad, hoping to understand his sudden behavior change. Through binoculars and note-taking, they pieced together Asad's movements, trying to find a pattern or a reason for the lion's proximity to the village. One fateful afternoon, as the sun descended, painting the sky in shades of purple and orange, a chilling incident occurred that would forever change the events in Mwanga. Thomas and Sarah, while tracking Asad, stumbled upon something that made their hearts sink. In a clearing not far from the village lay the remnants of what appeared to be a recent kill. The evidence was undeniable. Asad was the culprit. This discovery put Thomas in a moral dilemma. He had grown to admire Asad understanding the lion not as a mere subject of study, but as a majestic creature struggling for survival. Reporting this to the villagers would undoubtedly lead to a hunt for Asad, something Thomas wanted to avoid at all costs. The sun set on Mwanga that evening with a sense of foreboding. Thomas and Sarah sat in their makeshift research camp, debating their following action. Unbeknownst to them in the cover of the night, Asad moved stealthily, his amber eyes reflecting a mix of hunger and caution, inching ever closer to the village of Mwanga. As the night enveloped Mwanga, a chilling silence hung in the air, broken only by the distant cries of nocturnal creatures. The village, usually alive with the soft murmur of evening activities, was tranquil. Heeding Elder Mizi Juma's advice, the villagers stayed indoors, a sense of dread settling over them. Thomas and Sarah, unable to shake off their concern, decided to conduct a night patrol around the village's perimeter. Equipped with flashlights and a sense of urgency, they trod carefully, scanning the darkness for any sign of Asad. As they neared the western edge of the village, close to a dense thicket, a sudden rustle in the bushes halted them in their tracks. Before they could react, Asad emerged, his muscular frame silhouetted against the moonlit sky. The encounter was sudden and unexpected. Thomas and Sarah found themselves frozen, mere meters away from the lion. At that moment, Asad's eyes met Thomas's, a fleeting connection that spoke of wildness and instinct. But hunger overrode the momentary understanding, and with a ferocious growl, Asad lunged at them. 
Thomas pushed Sarah out of the way, taking the brunt of the attack himself. The lion's powerful jaws clamped down on Thomas's arm, dragging him to the ground. Sarah, recovering from the initial shock, scrambled to her feet and screamed for help, her voice piercing the night. The villagers, awakened by the commotion, rushed out with torches and whatever makeshift weapons they could find. The scene they encountered was one of sheer terror. Thomas lay on the ground, writhing in pain as Asad stood over him, his fangs bared. In a desperate attempt to save Thomas, the villagers advanced, their shouts and torches creating chaos. Startled by the sudden uproar, Asad released his grip on Thomas and retreated into the darkness, disappearing into the thicket. The villagers quickly gathered around Thomas, his arm severely injured, blood seeping through his torn shirt. Amina, the village's only nurse, rushed to the scene, her medical kit in hand. With swift and expert care, she tended to Thomas's wounds, doing her best to stabilize him. The severity of the injuries, however, was beyond her expertise. Thomas needed urgent medical attention, something Mwanga's limited resources could not provide. A decision was made to transport Thomas to the nearest town with a hospital, a journey fraught with challenges given the rough terrain and the lack of proper transportation. A group of villagers led by Elder Minzi Juma prepared a makeshift stretcher, and with great care they lifted Thomas onto it. As the villagers set off on the arduous journey, Sarah stayed by Thomas's side, her face etched with worry and guilt. The moon, now high in the sky, cast a pale light on the procession as they navigated through the savanna, each step a race against time. Back in the village, the night was no longer calm. Fear and uncertainty gripped the hearts of the residents. Once a majestic symbol of the wild, the lion had become a harbinger of danger, a threat lurking in the shadows. The journey to the hospital was a testament to the resilience and solidarity of the villagers of Mwanga. They moved swiftly under the starlit sky, their path lit only by torches in the moon's faint glow. Drifting in and out of consciousness, Thomas was unaware of the bumpy ride and the concerned faces surrounding him. After hours of strenuous travel, they finally reached the outskirts of the nearest town. The small but well-equipped hospital was a beacon of hope in the otherwise night. The medical staff, alerted by a runner sent ahead of the group, were ready to receive Thomas. In the emergency room, the doctors quickly assessed his condition. The lion's attack had left deep lacerations on his arm, and he had lost a significant amount of blood. The medical team worked tirelessly, their movements a blur as they tried to stabilize him. Exhausted and anxious, Sarah waited outside, her thoughts a whirlwind of worry and fear. Despite the doctor's best efforts, Thomas's condition worsened. The injury, coupled with the delay in receiving medical care, had led to severe complications. As the night turned into dawn, Thomas's weakened body could no longer fight. Surrounded by the medical staff and Sarah, who held his hand tightly, Thomas Fletcher succumbed to his injuries. The news of his death spread quickly, casting a somber mood over the hospital and soon reaching Mwanga. The village, which had sent off one of its own with hope and prayers, now mourned a tragic loss. Thomas, who had come to study and protect the wildlife, had become a victim of the nature he loved. Sarah, grief-stricken, returned to Mwanga to convey the heartbreaking news. The villagers gathered to pay their respects, their faces mixed with sorrow and disbelief. Elder Minzi Juma, his voice heavy with emotion, spoke of Thomas's passion for wildlife and how his work had brought a deeper understanding of the coexistence between humans and nature. In the days that followed, Mwanga was enveloped in a reflective silence. While mourning Thomas, the villagers also grappled with the reality of living alongside wild animals. The balance between respecting wildlife and ensuring their safety had never been more pronounced. Asad the lion remained a whispered legend in Mwanga. Some said he vanished into the depths of the savanna, never to be seen again. Others believed he still roamed the wilderness, a ghostly presence reminding them of the delicate line between man and beast. In the sprawling grasslands of southern Africa, where Botswana's wilderness stretched as far as the eye could see, there lay a small village named Tlaresilele. It was 1935, and Tlaresilele, with its traditional rendezvous and vibrant community, stood as a testament to the harmonious coexistence of man and nature. The story centers around Jacob Molefe, a young and ambitious wildlife photographer who journeyed from Johannesburg to Botswana in pursuit of capturing Africa's majestic wildlife through his lens. Jacob's fascination with cheetahs, 
the fastest land animals known for their elegance and prowess, had brought him to Clarissa Lili. Jacob's days in Botswana were filled with adventure and awe. He spent hours in the wilderness patiently waiting to glimpse the elusive cheetahs. His guide, a local villager named Themba, was an expert in tracking wildlife and had become Jacob's close friend and mentor. Clarissa Lili, though remote, was a community knit tightly by the bonds of tradition and mutual respect for the wilderness that surrounded them. The villagers had learned to live alongside the wildlife, understanding the delicate balance of their ecosystem. One evening, as the golden sun dipped below the horizon, painting the sky in shades of orange and red, Jacob and Themba ventured further into the wilderness than usual. Jacob was determined to photograph a cheetah in the twilight, a feat he believed would be the pinnacle of his collection. As they traversed the savanna, Themba cautioned Jacob about the dangers of being out after dark. The wilderness of Botswana was unforgiving, and predators roamed freely under the cloak of night. Jacob, driven by his passion, reassured Themba of his experience in the wild. Deep into their expedition, they spotted a cheetah. It was a breathtaking sight. The animal's spotted coat blended seamlessly with the tall grass, and its eyes glowed dimly. Thrilled, Jacob readied his camera, focusing entirely on capturing the perfect shot. In his absorption, Jacob failed to notice another presence lurking in the shadows. A second cheetah, hidden and silent, had been watching them. Without warning, it charged, its target clear and within reach. Themba shouted a warning, realizing the imminent danger, but it was too late. The cheetah pounced on Jacob, knocking him to the ground. The camera flew from his hands as he struggled against the powerful animal. Themba, armed only with a walking stick, rushed to his aid, doing his best to fend off the cheetah. The attack was swift and brutal. Jacob, despite his efforts to protect himself, suffered severe injuries. The commotion attracted the attention of a nearby patrol from Tlaris Alil, who managed to scare the cheetah away with loud noises and torches. Jacob lay on the ground, his body battered, his breathing labored. Themba quickly applied basic first aid to the best of his abilities, but it was evident that Jacob needed urgent medical attention. A rescue team from the village arrived and Jacob was carefully transported back to Tulera Salili. The villagers, who had come to admire the young photographer for his respect for their land and its creatures, gathered around, offering help and support. As the night progressed, Jacob's condition worsened. The nearest hospital was several hours away, and the village's limited medical resources were not equipped to treat injuries of such severity. The journey to the hospital was fraught with urgency and worry. Jacob, drifting in and out of consciousness, was haunted by the events of the evening. The cheetah, an animal he had admired for its beauty and grace, had shown him the unpredictable and wild side of nature. The journey to the hospital, a race against time and terrain, was marked by a sense of urgency that weighed heavily on everyone. Botswana's rough, unpaved countryside made the travel slow and arduous. Jacob Molefe, lying in the back of the vehicle, was barely conscious, his life hanging by a thread. Themba, who accompanied Jacob, watched over him with guilt and sorrow. He had come to respect Jacob as a visitor and a friend, who shared a deep love for Botswana's wildlife. Now, as he watched Jacob's labored breathing, Themba couldn't help but feel responsible for the tragic turn of events. As the vehicle traversed the bumpy roads, the first light of dawn began to break over the horizon. The beauty of the sunrise, a daily spectacle in the Botswana wilderness, seemed muted by the gravity of the situation. Inside the vehicle, the atmosphere was tense, and each kilometer traveled was filled with silent prayers and hope. However, the severity of Jacob's injuries, compounded by the delay in reaching medical care, proved to be too much. Just a few hours from the hospital, as the sun rose higher in the sky, Casting a warm glow over the savanna, Jacob succumbed to his injuries. His final moments were spent in the land he had grown to love, surrounded by the wilderness that had fueled his passion. Themba, grief-stricken, closed Jacob's eyes, a farewell gesture to a friend and fellow lover of the wild. The news of Jacob's passing was unfortunate in Clara Salili. The villagers mourned the loss of a young man who had come to capture the beauty of their land but had instead become a poignant reminder of the wild's unpredictable and often dangerous nature. Jacob's story, though tragic, left a lasting impact on Tahar Salili. It served as a reminder of the respect and caution one must have when interacting with nature, a testament to the delicate balance between human ambition and the untamed forces of the wilderness. Diani Village 
nestled along Kenya's picturesque coast, was where the ocean met the sky on an endless horizon. In 1912, Diani was a peaceful community, its rhythm dictated by the tides and the changing seasons. The villagers, mostly fishermen and small-scale farmers, lived harmoniously with the land and sea. The main character of our story is Elena Wanjiku, a young woman known for her adventurous spirit and profound love for the wild. The daughter of a fisherman, Elena had grown up listening to tales of the ocean and the dense forests that bordered Diani village. Elena's days were filled with exploration. She loved to wander along the coastline, collecting shells and watching the waves crash against the shore. However, her curiosity often drew her to the edge of the nearby forest, a place teeming with wildlife and lush vegetation. The village, though serene, was not without its challenges. Recent sightings of a lone lion named Jabari, meaning brave in Swahili, had stirred concern among the villagers. Jabari, a majestic male lion with a thick mane, had been seen prowling near the village, his presence an ominous reminder of the wild's unpredictable nature. One afternoon, as the sun hung low in the sky, casting a golden glow over the village, Elena decided to venture into the forest to gather medicinal herbs. Unbeknownst to her, Jabari was lurking in the shadows, his hunger driving him closer to the village. As Elena hummed a local tune, her basket half filled with herbs, she suddenly felt a presence behind her. Turning around, she came face to face with Jabari. The lion stood mere meters away, his eyes locked onto hers. Elena's heart raced and her breath caught in her throat. She remembered her father's advice to stand still and not show fear in front of a wild animal. But Jabari, driven by instinct, saw only a potential meal. With a thunderous roar, he charged at Elena. She screamed, turning to run, but Jabari was faster. He pounced, knocking her to the ground. His claws raked across her back, leaving deep wounds. The commotion caught the attention of some villagers nearby. They rushed towards the scene, shouting and waving their arms to scare the lion away. Altering by the villagers' sudden arrival, Jabari released Elena and retreated into the forest depths. Elena lay on the forest floor, her clothes torn and bloodied. The villagers quickly returned her to the village where the local healer treated her. Her injuries were severe, and she drifted in and out of consciousness, her mind a whirlwind of fear and pain. As Elena lay in bed that night, the day's events replayed in her mind. The attack had shattered the illusion of safety she had always felt in her beloved village. The lion, a creature she had admired from a distance, had shown her the harsh realities of the wild. In Diani village, a sense of unease settled over the community. The attack by Jabari had ignited a deep-seated fear and a newfound respect for the boundaries between the village and the wild. A palpable tension marked the following days in Diani village as the news of Elena Wanjiku's encounter with Jabari the lion spread like wildfire. Once living harmoniously indifferent to the wild, the villagers were confronted with its stark and brutal reality. Elena, confined to her bed, lay in a state of agony. Her wounds, though treated with the best of the village healer's knowledge, were grievously deep. Infections set in despite the herbal practices applied with hope and prayer. Her father, a stoic man who had braved the ocean's fury, sat by her bedside, his eyes reflecting a sea of pain and helplessness. The villagers rallied around Elena's family, offering support and assistance. However, the rudimentary medical resources in Diani village were ill-equipped to deal with injuries of such severity. It was clear that Elena needed more advanced care, a facility that could only be found in the nearest city, several hours away by road. A decision was made to transport Elena to the city hospital. The journey was arduous, the roads unpaved and winding, jostling the makeshift stretcher on which Elena lay. Her father accompanied her, holding her hand, whispering words of encouragement, though his heart was heavy with fear. Upon reaching the hospital, Elena was immediately taken into intensive care. The doctors, upon examining her wounds, expressed grave concern. The infections had spread and her condition was deteriorating rapidly. Despite their efforts to stabilize her, Elena's body, weakened by blood loss and trauma, struggled to respond to the treatment. Back in Diani village, the atmosphere was somber. The villagers, who had once listened to Elena's laughter as she played along the coastline, now whispered prayers for her recovery. Her story had become a tragic testament to the unforeseen dangers lurking in the wild. As days passed, Elena's condition fluctuated, giving brief moments of hope that were quickly dashed by subsequent complications. Her father remained by her side, a silent sentinel, his eyes betraying the turmoil. He watched as his vibrant daughter fought for her life, a battle that seemed increasingly impossible. 
In her lucid moments, Elena spoke of her love for Diani village, her dreams of exploring the world beyond the savanna, and her respect for the wild that had shaped her life. Her voice, once clear and robust, was now a faint whisper, echoing the fragility of her state. Finally, after a week of relentless struggle, the inevitable dawned. Elena's body could no longer withstand the trauma. Surrounded by her father, the medical staff, and a few villagers who had traveled to be with her, Elena Wanjaku breathed her last. Her departure left a void, a silence that resonated beyond the hospital room's walls. The news of her passing was received in Diani village with a collective mourning. The villagers gathered to pay their respects, their faces etched with sorrow and a deep sense of loss. Elena, the young woman who had walked fearlessly into the forest and embraced life with a rare zeal, was no more. Her funeral was a poignant affair attended by the entire village. Now a broken man, her father spoke of his daughter's bravery and undying love for the natural world. He implored the villagers to remember her spirit, to live in harmony with the land and sea, just as Elena had. Diani village slowly returned to its routine in the following weeks, but the shadow of Elena's tragic fate lingered. Jabari the lion became a legend, a reminder of the wild's unpredictable and often relentless nature. The villagers, while continuing their coexistence with nature, now carried a renewed respect and caution for the untamed world that bordered their lives. Elena's story, a tragic blend of adventure and sorrow, became a part of Diani's lore, a tale passed down through generations, a cautionary reminder of the delicate balance between humanity and the wild.